And I was just like, okay, these are the, is... these are the five pillars of evolution, and I'm gonna go through each one real quick. The first one is evolution happens, populations change over time, and that that's true. Things do change over time, but then they go and add these other ones. It's genetic change in populations over long periods of time. Okay, but there's actually five parts to the theory of evolution, and if you want to say it's true, you have to say that all five parts are true. Okay, so there's part two, which is that it's... So it can only be that number one is true, they all have to be true. Usually gradual, and by gradual I don't mean, you know, it takes gazillions of years for evolution to occur, but I mean it does not happen overnight. It takes hundreds or thousands or even millions of years for appreciable genetic change to happen in populations. Okay, we can get These parts that. of the theory don't all stand or fall together. You can have evolution, for example, but it doesn't have to be gradual. So you have to support each of these pillars independently. Speciation occurs. This is my area of expertise. It's more than just evolution. You have to have a lineages which branch to create descendant species. Okay, speciation occurs because you decide to label uh, species B and C as different types of species. Let's say B is a rabbit that lives in the cold and C is a rabbit that lives in the heat. Well, they're the same kind of animal, but you just decided to label them as different species just because they live in different environments. Um, if we had, this branching had not occurred, we'd still only have one highly evolved species with us today, the descendant, the lineal descendant of the first organism. But we have at least 9 million species on Earth today, and that's because this branching process has occurred, and it's happened so profusely that now we have to represent the tree of life by this sort of circle of life, and even this is compressed considerably. There's the ancestral organism right there of all species, and then it's just branched into these gazillions of things here through the branching process. So we have to support that too. Okay. Now, the process that organisms split, the idea split, leads to the converse that if you trace any pair of organisms back in time, in this branch here, for example, B and C, if you trace them back in time, you're going to find a single ancestor that was their common ancestor, the so-called missing link. And it would be this, so, the same kind of animal there. It wouldn't be a different kind of animal. Part four of evolution is that all species share a common ancestry. You can pick any two species on Earth, like a fern and a squirrel. Okay, did you hear that? This is where it starts to get very religious and speculative, imaginative. He's saying a fern and a squirrel share a common ancestor, and you can trace it back, supposedly, and they have the same, the same ancestry. And, some, and we can now trace back approximately when that common ancestor lived between these two species and when it lived using molecular data. But this, of course, this splitting process and this common ancestry has to be supported independently. Here's the, the common ancestry of humans and the primate lineage. Uh, we share a common ancestry with chimps about 7 million years ago, with uh, gorillas about 10, orangutans about 13. Okay, he's sharing his religion right here 7 million years ago and then 10 million years ago, and then 13 million years ago. Well, how old is this guy? How, how can he be so sure? He takes it on faith. That what we mean by being most com closely related to something means that our common ancestor with that thing existed more recently. So we're more closely related to chimps than we are to gorillas because our common ancestor with the chimps lived more recently than our common ancestor with the gorillas. You probably know all this stuff, so my apologies if I'm preaching to what you already know. And finally, the last... And he said preaching there. He's preaching his religion, that is. Part of the, the pillar of the theory of evolution is the idea that much of evolutionary change, although not all of it, is caused by the process of natural selection, which I will assume you know or have an inkling of because it uh, takes too long to describe. The, it is the only force. It's not really a force. It's what happens. It is the only um, process that occurs that gives organisms the appearance of being adapted to their environments. Okay, well, natural selection doesn't create anything new. It's just limiting what you already have. If you get a different beak, it, it, you didn't get that just because of evolution. You already had that beak. It just so happened to have, has changed a little bit, but, I mean, the animal is still the same thing. The marvelous fish, fins of the fish, the beak of the woodpecker, the spines of the cactus, and so on. And again, this is independent of what I said before. You can have all this stuff 
points one to four occurring, and yet it might not have occurred largely by natural selection. There are other kinds of evolutionary processes that have been proposed to cause both adaptation and evolution. So these are the five pillars of the theory of evolution, and I want to try to support all of them in the, the talk. So what is the evidence? Evolution is a scientific... Okay, well, that's enough for now. Um, might make part two or whatever later, but thanks for watching.